Like many people today working on advancing democracy, I'm an optimist. This strange condition began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on the World Web, and all my textbooks were out of date. So I told my teachers I want to quit school and start my education on the World Web. Surprisingly, all my teachers agreed with it. And so a year later, I founded my first startup of many, working on web technologies. And I discovered this fabulous internet community that runs with this crazy idea of an open, multi-stakeholder political system that powers the internet still today. Today, as Taiwan's first digital minister, I'm putting into practice the lesson that I learned when I was 15 years old. And that's radical transparency, civic participation, and rough consensus. And surprisingly, it's working and it's transforming our society. Now, I want you to uh, look at my office. This is literally my office. I'm a teleworking minister, so I can work from anywhere on Earth, including here. But this place is special. I meet people every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's my office hour. Anyone can come to here and talk to me as long as they agree for our conversation to be posted to the Internet. It's called radical transparency. And so this space itself is a co-creation of more than 100 social innovators who come to me and say, for example, a team of designers, of artists, work with people with trisomy differences, with Down syndrome, and say, oh, they look at the world in a very different geometric lens. So how about we make their artwork real and install them as public installation of art, like the soccer field here. And so this space uh, imbues a spirit of creativity in it, and just talk to me every Wednesday can make this space grow more interesting. So it's not just human visitors. We have this self-driving robotic visitors for three times now, each time for a month or so. So they are self-driving tricycles from the MIT Media Lab. But the great thing about these vehicles is that first, it's really slow. It doesn't harm anyone if it runs into buildings or even to people. But the second thing is that it's open source and open hardware, meaning anyone with any knowledge of computer programming or hardware can tinker them to fit the, what the society wants. So for example, people saw that it only had one eye, the red eye in the middle. It's like a <coughs> cyclop, and it's not very friendly. So people changed it so that it has two eyes. It can wink and blink at you and integrates better with the society. And this is how we figure out the norm, uh, how the AI should live with humans instead of having the technology dictating the society. We have the social innovation <coughs> working with technologists. And this is in tune of what our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, said two and a half years ago at her inauguration. She said, before, democracy is seen as a clash between two opposing values. But from now on, democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. And indeed, in traditional thinking, the government is like a rope in the middle, with each ministry maybe a knot. And each different forces, like for economic development versus environmental eco-friendliness, is like the tension that pulls the strings that is the government itself. But now we have a new way of thinking called social innovation. In social innovation, we can develop business models that further the social environmental goals. And the government's role has changed. Instead of asking what is the fair, the best arbitration, we ask two new questions. First, we ask, given our different positions, is there some common values, after all, that everyone can live with? And the second question is, given the common values, can we come up with innovations that deliver these values to everybody? And indeed, in Taiwan, we use a lot of very novel regulatory policy-making tools, like the sandbox system that makes the social innovation possible. What is a sandbox? A sandbox is essentially an innovator come to us <coughs> and say, I have this very interesting new idea. It could be about platform economy, it could be about fintech, it could be about self-driving vehicles, you name it, it could be anything. And I think 
the innovator says the government's regulations is out of date. Now, instead of fighting with the innovator, we, the regulator, now say, OK, now you're given a year. And during the year, we agree to run with your new version of the regulation, what we call a forked version of regulation, and try it out for a year. So the whole society knows what this wonderful new idea really looks like. And by the end of the year, everybody looks at those hybrid models of transportation, those self-driving vehicles, can say together whether this is actually beneficial to the society. And if it works after a year, then their version of the regulation become our version of the regulation. And if it doesn't work, well, it's open innovation, so we thank the investors for paying the tuition for everyone, and the new innovator can begin where the previous innovator left off. And whenever the members of the parliament think that we want to make a new law, the innovators are given up to four years, essentially a monopoly because everybody else is still illegal. And while the MPs figure it out, and of course, by the time they figure out the law, the competitor will enter the market. Now, how do we actually discover what the regional society needs? How do we even discover where the indigenous, the rural, the remote islands needs? Well, I tour around Taiwan every couple Tuesday or so. So Wednesday, people come to Taipei, our capital city, and on Tuesdays, I travel around Taiwan. The greatest thing about Taiwan is that we have broadband as a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second of internet bandwidth, it's my fault. You can talk to me. And unlimited um, data transmission with 4G network is less than 20 euros per month for everybody. And because of this, anywhere I am in Taiwan, I can set up this high-speed two-way video conference connection with the Taipei Social Innovation Lab. So I talk with the local social enterprises, NGOs, co-ops, and so on, and to figure out what their local social issues are like. And meanwhile, in Taipei, 12 different ministries people gather in the Social Innovation Lab to meet eye to eye through telepresence with the local people. And so this is better than the previous way, where the Ministry of Economy will get an idea, and then they will say, oh, we'll have to consult the Ministry of Interior, who will consult the Ministry of Health and Welfare, and so on. And after like three passes, nobody really remembers what was the original social situation. It's just some PowerPoints, right? So in this way, people cannot just say, oh, I'll have to consult the Ministry of Interior, because the Ministry of Interior is sitting right next to them. And so people really have to brainstorm on the spot and to figure out some ways to meet the social need. And so whenever we have a public demonstration of a self-driving vehicle or um, green energy and things like that, we have a public demo that's in the Shaolin Green City. It's near a high-speed rail station. Another great thing about Taiwan is from the northmost to the southmost city by high-speed rails, it's just an hour and a half. So even though we're just, you know, 23 million people, actually it is a really tight-knit community. So everybody can just hop on the high-speed rails and visit those self-driving cars, like going to a zoo and having um, an opportunity to try out the interactions by ourselves. Now, <clears throat> when I said everybody does a consultation to get each other's feelings, whether this is acceptable to the society, the emerging technology after a year, what do I really mean by that? Usually, we run an AI-moderated conversation. This is called Polis. It's an open source tool, meaning just like the self-driving vehicles, anyone can take and modify it to your liking. And this is the consultation, the map that we had when we moderated the Uber case. That is the first case that Taiwan handled in 2015. And in here, you can see that thousands of people in different maps of the opinion canvas. And you, the blue avatar, is in the middle. So you can see what your friends and family think about one particular social issue, and they're all over the place. And when we run a consultation like this, we use the focus conversation method. And this means, first, we ask everybody for data. In Taiwan, when we say open data, we don't just mean open government data. We mean open citizen data as well. Everybody can contribute the factual data for people to have a reflection on. And somewhat interestingly, we allocate one month for people's feelings about the same data. And so about the same facts, you can feel happy, I can feel angry, it's all okay, right? And so after a month of checking in with each other's feelings, do we move to ideation? And by then, we can say the best ideas are the ones that takes care of the most people's feelings. 
And then once we have the rough consensus, we can just get those consensus and sign them into new laws and new regulations. And so we put a lot of care into the design of the interaction. So for example, on self-driving vehicles, you can see one statement, one feeling from your fellow citizen, and you can agree or disagree with it. As you agree or disagree, your avatar will move toward the people that feels pretty much like you. But unlike many other online forums, there is one thing missing here. There is no reply button. We discover that if we don't have the reply button, the trolls go away. Trolls thrive on the reply button because they can attack the person, not the statement. But if you take away the reply button, if you see something that you really don't agree with, <coughs> you can just click disagree, and that's the most you can do. And then, of course, you can propose something else for other people to resonate with. And so after running a consultation for a month or so, we always get a shape like this. And this is maybe the most important slide in this entire deck. If you look only at mainstream media, or indeed some social media, people often think that the society is divided, like two dogs pulling a rope, right? And they're mostly focused on those like five things that is the most divisive. However, using polis, we can see clearly that most people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. It's just it doesn't dominate the regular discussion on social and popular media. And by giving people a reflection of the rough consensus that they actually had, we can put those into regulation first, because it's already a norm, while tabling or deferring the legislation of the divisive issues. We can experiment for another year so that everybody has first-hand experience before deciding. And so that is how we deliver the social innovations that is a picture of the people's consensus. And when I said forking the government or forking the regulatory system, there is one of the largest civic technology community in Taiwan, or rather started from Taiwan and went everywhere in the world, and it's called GovZero or G0V. It starts with a really simple idea. All the government websites in Taiwan ends with gov.tw, and this domain name is g0v.tw. For each of the service of the public service that the people don't like or think that is too boring or think that it's missing, instead of blaming why nobody is doing this, the motto of Gov0 is admitting that we're the nobody that can do this. And so in the, every public service website in Taiwan, something that gov.tw, if you, if you change a O to the zero, then you get into the shadow government website that is interactive, that is open source, that delivers a forked, a new vision of the public service. And so in 2012, the first Gov0 project is called the National Budget Visualization. It used to be the national budget of Taiwan is 500 pages of PDF, and nobody wants to read through them. But Gov0 made it so that it become an interactive map. You can drill down to the particular budget item that you care about and have a real-time conversation. And after I become the digital minister, of course, I merged this innovation back into the government. So now in the e-participation platform of Taiwan, of which 5 million people out of 23 million is a part of, um, you can see thousands of different ministerial projects, all the procurement, KPIs, and things like that. Anyone can comment on it, and the Korea Public Service just respond to you directly without the mediation of MPs or of journalists. And this enables an overview effect of the citizen to what the government is doing. Another recent example of Gov0 is this airbox experiment. In Taiwan, people care about the air quality, for example, PM2.5 and so on. And so about 2,000 people all individually purchased some small devices, IoT devices called airbox. And it measures air quality for less than 100 euros. So it can be put on your schools, on your balcony, or anywhere. And it's not just measuring for you. People publish it to a distributed ledger or blockchain so that people can uh, rest assured that people will not mutate, change each other's numbers. And the government can suddenly see much more because people can contribute their citizen science measurements. Of course, that is not just limited to Taiwan, because the airbox system is open source. Anywhere in the world, people can just download and run with it. And the great thing about Taiwan's democracy is that we 
when we see this kind of legitimacy threatening civic tech projects, instead of beating them, of course, we join them. And so we look at systemically <coughs> where in the map is missing, maybe in industrial parks, maybe above the Pescador Islands, and then we set up the air boxes where the people think there should be, but the civic tech community can't quite get there. And so every year, we run a presidential hackathon based on the data of the collective intelligence, the CI system, the environmental data system. In a presidential hackathon, everybody can propose any idea. Every year, we get hundreds of ideas. And each idea is shuffled into a trilingual team of data scientists, of domain experts, and of public servants. And so each of the trilingual team delivers their pitch to the president by the end of the three months co-creation process. And five teams every year win the prize of no money. They want a trophy from the president herself, and the trophy is a projector. If you turn on the projector, it projects the image of the president herself handing you the trophy. And it's very useful in interagency communication. And they get a presidential promise that whatever their proof of concept is, in the next fiscal year, the Taiwan government will implement the idea as the public service, so maximizing the impact. And so this is how Taiwan contributes not just to one or two of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but rather, especially on Goal 17, that is to say, to build reliable data that people can mutually trust, to build partnership out of those common data and facts, and through open innovation to make sure that it delivers things to the betterment of everybody. And in the last minute, I want to read you my job description that I wrote when I first became digital minister. It goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Thank you.